Thank you very much, and thank you for coming. Um, one logistical thing, normally uh, the room has to be cleared at 5-2, and of course many of you will have uh, places to go. Um, but I know there's a, a bunch of people here who've come especially over from uh, Paris. Um, what I said is that I would um, stay behind afterwards, and the room still will be available, so we can continue discussing the paper um, afterwards, okay? Right. Um, the paper's about the consequences. W what does Facebook actually do to us? Um, but I study it as an anthropologist. Now, why would an anthropologist be especially interested in Facebook? Well, go to a party and somebody comes up to you and says, well, what do you do? And you say, oh, I'm an anthropologist. And they say, oh, that, that sounds very interesting. Uh, uh, anthropologists, don't they, they study people, yeah? Um, not like psychologists, you know, you study people. I said, well, actually not quite the same as psychologists. And they say, well, what's the difference? I mean, what exactly does an anthropologist do? And so you might say to them, well, there are many kinds of psychologists out there, but in general, they tend to work on people um, as individuals, in general. Um, anthropologists actually really don't do that very much. We tend to come from studies such as kinship, where we're looking at people um, in relation to other people in a wider social context. So it's, it's more that relatedness that we're concerned with, a kind of network of people. So we don't really look at a person just as a person. You could say we look at a person as a kind of site from which there's social networking. Um, and that would have been a perfectly good definition of anthropology, that we study people as social networking sites. So if that's the case, and we're just sitting there as anthropologists, kind of minding our own business, well, yeah, we're anthropologists, minding everybody else's business, um, and then out of the blue, along comes something, and it calls itself social networking sites. So it wouldn't be surprising then if anthropologists kind of sat up and said, this sounds like something for us. But there's a second reason. The other reason is the temptation, and you get this in the media exposure especially, is to think of the likes of Facebook in terms of where it comes from. Films about Mark Zuckerberg or the company and those kind of things. Um, or US college kids and Harvard and the rest of it. You know that. But that is not Facebook today. Facebook today is 800 million people, where the expanding use is likely to be uh, a middle-aged woman in Turkey or Indonesia who's getting into this thing right now. And if we want to know about that, if we recognize that Facebook is not the company, but Facebook is actually the consequences it has on those people, then that, again, is the domain of anthropology. We're the people, like in our digital anthropology program, who are set up to try and investigate the consequences of these things. In other words, Facebook isn't just one thing anymore, because the Turkish Facebook is going to be different from the Indonesian Facebook. They will do it in Turkish and Indonesian ways. So you only even know what Facebook actually is once you've gone the, to do the study to find out what people have actually made of it in that particular place. That's the other reason why, for me, it has to be an anthropological project, amongst other things. Now, what I'm going to do, as quick as I can, is to take it up a series of registers. I'm going to look at the impact on the individual, on relationships, on community, on the home, and might end up in terms of our relationship to God, but let's see if we get there. Um, start, though, at the beginning. Um, and one reason for focusing on the individual is because when something like Facebook and other internet developments come there, the tendency is to fit them into an academic narrative, if you like, the way academics conventionally think about social change and tend to fit in these new developments into that story of social change. And the dominant story that is there, not just in anthropology, but throughout the social sciences, is kind of once upon a time, we lived in the sorts of societies that you would have expected anthropologists to be studying. You know, the communities, kinship, the small-scale societies, close interaction. But over time, there's been an erosion of those things for all sorts of reasons, industrialization, capitalism, whatever. And increasingly, we're looking at um, a highly individualized or growing um, tendency towards individualism um, really pretty much throughout the world. And so the assumption tends to be that you look at a new digital technology like this, and it's fitted into that as an exemplification of that story. So if you look at probably the most influential academic takes on these digital developments, 
They would be um, people like uh, Manuel Castells, there's three very well-known volumes, in which he talks about there being a, a bipolar opposition between the net and the self. Or you might read another sociologist like Barry Wellman, for example, and he sees these things in terms of a new phenomena called uh, network individualism which at first glance seems obvious enough. You know, what do you got? You've got a person sitting there with their computer, networking in with other people. It looks like network individualism, and certainly as the internet developed, you can see the way individuals found new networks around interests that they were developing, whatever they might be, through the likes of the internet. But should we assume, actually, that the likes of Facebook is simply part of the same old story? Maybe, but we need to investigate it. And particularly, we need to investigate it in a diversity of sites around the world to see what's happening. So to give an example of some recent work, not by myself, but by somebody called Deirdre Mackay, who's been working in the Philippines. Um, she's looked at the sites of the villages where she's been working, and also she works with uh, diaspora Filipinos who work often as domestic workers in London and the relationship between the two. And briefly, what she found was that if you look at the Facebook sites of these Filipinos in their villages, actually, these tend to see themselves as links with much wider extended families. There are images that relate to iconic sites in the village or in the local town, ancestral images that are there. In other words, these are not the way we normally think of the individual use as a U.S. college kid. It's something very different. Same with the people back in... Back in not that, the people in London. Um, very intense communities, often geared around a particular church that they're going to. And the Facebook material is all about who went to church that week. What did they eat? What did they wear? And like those intense communities, it has all the kind of... Dance. One of the things these Filipinos are very keen to learn in terms of digital technologies is Photoshop. And the reason they want Photoshop is so they can Photoshop out somebody they've just had a bitter quarrel with, okay, in this community, and exclude them from all the photos where they were previously present. And there's all sorts of little, you know, witchcraft accusations, all sorts of these things going on. But the point she's making is that if you look at this usage and also the, 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 the way it, Facebook is being used to connect the two sites, this looks classically Filipino in the way it's used. And indeed, the theories, the anthropological theories she's actually using to discuss this material is coming from the work of Marilyn Strathern, who writes about um, societies in Highland New Guinea, which are pretty much the exact antithesis to everything we think of as kind of this new forms of highly individualized society. And the same would be true of much of my own work. So point number one is this. No, there is no reason to fit this in to the general narrative, to assume this is just continuity in some trajectory towards greater individualism. And indeed, if you think about what Facebook actually does in terms of networking, does it really look like it's something that's making people more individualistic? Or does it look like it's making them actually more socially networked, which is the kind of way that anthropologists have traditionally looked at people? The answer is neither one nor other, actually. It's if you go to the US, where people are more individualistic in various ways, then Facebook is likely to follow in that direction. If you go to the Philippines, it's likely to be the other way around. So, the individual. The next stage up is to look at the impact on relationships. And for that, I was also working, as it happens, in the Philippines. Um, the work that we did was to try and investigate the impact of these new media technologies like Facebook. But our feeling was, as anthropologists, if you really want to know what these new technologies are, don't actually go to the techno files, the lay, you know, Silicon Valley people and the state of the art and the latest gimmick, etc. That's not what it actually is. Go to the people for whom this is really going to matter and the consequences are really going to matter. So what we did was looked at Filipinos who were working in the UK, but who had left their children behind in the Philippines, often 10, 15 years of absence, very occasional visiting. And the reason we did that is we appreciated that for those people here, the ability to actually be a mother would depend on the capacity of those technologies. Um, the, because the only communication you had with your children was through those. 
So we looked at the whole trajectory from letters and cassettes, historically, up to the new media, and tried to find out what difference that make. And the point, being anthropologists, is you're not saying there is a given thing called a mother, how does a mother use the technology? We are saying that the very concept of mother is something we're not at all certain about, and indeed the people we're working with have many different models of what being a good or bad mother might be. And the technology has as much an impact on what a mother becomes as being a mother has an impact on what the technology becomes. So through this, we look, for example, at um, uses of Facebook and actually Friendster, which is another social network site they use. And we're looking at a variety of different examples. We look at um, places where it's worked pretty well. So, for example, somebody who's now growing up, because they've been separated 15 years, they're becoming uh, of an age where they want to change their relationship with their mother. Um, they want it to be a more adult, more equal kind of relationship, more, you know, best friend kind of relationship. And they, indeed, managed to use the sort of, the fact, the, the distancing but, and autonomy, but also the closeness you can get with these sites to create a relationship that they feel is quite satisfactory. At the other extreme, I remember talking to a 19-year-old kid who had actually not seen his mother much at all, and actually hadn't been treated that well by his mother, to be honest. Um, but he had a very idealised uh, sense of who his mother should be. He still wanted to have a mother, even if it was his projection of what a mother is. And then suddenly, out of the blue, he got a friend's request. And he looked, he, he accepted it, and he saw his mother, and his mother, who was in the Middle East at the time, was posting the kind of things that students here would see as perfectly normal. Um, but resonated very differently with this guy. And I remember him saying to me, I looked, my mother looked like a prostitute. He couldn't relate to these images that he saw on Facebook of his mother. And he, this was a very devastating thing. He actually closed his account completely. And all sorts of, of things followed from that. So it can work in very different ways. But the point is that the relationship and the media constitute each other. In fact, we came up with a new term for this. Um, because we realized if you want to study Facebook, you shouldn't study it just on its own. Facebook actually works with all the other media that people are using simultaneously. So the term we used was polymedia to reflect that. And the difference that polymedia represented is not just that there's a whole lot of new technologies out there, but that our relationship to them is changing, particularly in these kinds of places. Because it used to be, if you want to know why did somebody pick a particular digital media to use, or a phone, um, or email, or something else, then often it was a case either it was what they could afford, or it was what they had access to. But in the last year or two, many of these people, many low-income people that I'm dealing with, um, they find um, that they, they, once they paid for the, the, the phone infrastructurally and the computer infrastructurally, an individual communication has no cost. Um, so it isn't any more cost and access. And the change that represents is that people are now judging each other as to which media they choose to communicate on. So, for example, there's a nice book by Ilana Gershon called The Breakup 2.0. And it's a book about how girlfriends and boyfriends dump each other. Right? Now, it's bad enough getting dumped, but how did they dump you? Did they do it in person? Did they do it by phone? Did they change their relationship status on Facebook? Uh, or did they send you a text, right? And the point being is that it means the media themselves have a new social and indeed moral relationship to us. That these become not just technologies that we use, but we judge each other according to which we use and how we use them. And that is an important change in terms of the impact these have and the way we have to think about them. In some ways, they are less technical than they used to be because the choice of media between, let's say, over Facebook can also be power relations. The kids feel more comfortable than their parents. So the kids try and get the conversation going on Facebook or the parents feel they have more control over the phone because they're paying for it or something. So there's all sorts of issues going on. But that all came about, our ideas about this came about, because we chose to study people for whom it really mattered. To be a mother depended on how you could seize the possibilities of this particular technology and make it into something. And indeed, one of the reasons we worked both in the Philippines and actually we then went and studied their children, and I should advertise here because the results are in a book called Migration and New Media that came out a few weeks ago, um, 
The reason we work with both is, not surprisingly, the mothers generally felt these technologies were enabling in becoming a mother. The kids were a lot more ambivalent, actually. Some of them certainly felt that the results were worse because they felt they would be over the, the amount of surveillance, the fact that their parents didn't really understand how old they were, there were all sorts of complicated things going on there. Um, so we've got the individual, we've got um, relationships, which can be made or unmade through the likes of Facebook. In the other book that I'm going to advertise, which is called Tales of Facebook, um, this is a study actually of Facebook itself based in Trinidad, in the Caribbean. It's a southern part of the Caribbean. You can sort of see Venezuela from Trinidad. It's not really big. You can drive around it in a day. Um, and a lot of my studies over the last couple of decades actually have been based in Trinidad. So it's a place I knew reasonably well. And one of the points is, of any anthropological work, is to say that Facebook doesn't exist in any one place, as I said at the beginning. Facebook, if Trinidadians use Facebook this way, that's what Facebook then is for that place, okay? There's no reason to think one place is more authentic and the other place is just borrowing. It's reinvented in each place that it's used. So if you look at that book, you find that the first story is a story about um, somebody called Marvin and his relationship with his wife. And the point being that um, his wife is already worried about how Marvin is behaving with respect to other women for all sorts of reasons that I got into in that. But the thing about Facebook is that before she was just kind of worried in the slightly more abstract sense, now she can actually see, you know, Tuesday. Previously he had friends 620. Now he has 621. Who's the one? <laughs> right? And is it a female? And if it is, what's going on? And et cetera, et cetera. And what you actually found, the marriage broke up. And it was one of those cases where I think you really could sit there and say that this marriage would not have broken up but for the existence of Facebook. It just added something to those tensions, which actually led to this kind of jealousy um, and, and, and the way in which he simply couldn't handle um, what was going on. He actually had good reason. But anyway, um, that was a case where it broke up. Equally in the book, though, there's another case of a guy called Arvind. And this guy is really shy, really, really shy. He's not doing very well in life. Nothing's particularly going well for him in any respect. Um, he's trying to train as an assistant for the elderly, etc., but he hasn't got a job at the moment, etc. And he's particularly shy around girls. Um, but a group of girls get him to start playing a game called Face uh, Farmville. And I'm not going to go into the details of Farmville, but Farmville depends on all sorts of reciprocal and you have to get your neighbours to help invest in your farm and you invest in their farm. It's a very sociable game in various ways. And through that, he got to know these people, and through that, when he went to class, he started speaking with some of the girls. So this was a case where if the last one was you could see the difference that Facebook made in terms of breaking up a relationship, here you could see the difference that Facebook made in actually helping this guy create relationships. It can work either way. Um, and actually, Farmville is interesting here because it, it, the radical difference that Facebook has made. I mean, one of the places you can see it is actually in the world of gaming. Up to now, you know, if we talked about computer games, your image is a 16-year-old kid who's at home, you know, blasting the universe through World of Warcraft or something. That's what a computer game was. Farmville is probably the world's biggest computer game right now. And the typical player will very likely be an older woman in Turkey or Indonesia as opposed to, that's what computer games now are. It's us who have problem getting up to speed with the way these things are changing. And it is more sociable. Um, similarly, you find that um, um, there are changes in the way that, um, sorry a second, um, yeah, um, the internet had um, tended to create a particular way of networking in which uh, people tended to um, look for people who had very specific interests that they also had. So if you had a, an obscure interest, like, I don't know, fair trade shoes or BDSM or something, you could look on um, the networks to find people who had these kind of shared interests, right? Facebook's not like that. Facebook, you started off with a recognizable set of peers, and then everyone knows that the, the key moment in the history of Facebook was when my mother's just tried to friend me, right? Remember that? And suddenly, things are getting muddled 
Because, like, do you want your mother in the same place that you got your friends? And then, worse, often much worse, my boss insists <laughs> that he's a friend on, or she's a friend on Facebook. And then what's going on? So, in an interesting way, um, you can see that the one kind of trajectory that was leading to these differentiated networks is actually reversed here, as all the previously differentiated networks are actually coming together in the same place, and that too has consequences. And those consequences bring me to my next topic, which is the topic of community. Now, just like there's a lot of stuff in the newspapers, etc., about the notion of the self and the individual, and what Facebook does to that. There's also a lot of blah about community, right? And ever since the beginning of the internet, people have said, oh, this is bringing us back to community, right? Suddenly, we all live in virtual communities again. I mean, what the hell people thought, as it were, offline communities were is actually pretty contentious, um, let alone what we mean by online. And actually, in the first piece of work I did, um, Ten years before this, I went with a guy called Don Slater, and we did a, a book about the internet in Trinidad as opposed to Facebook in Trinidad. Maybe the future of Facebook will be actually very different from the past. And having conducted this study in Trinidad, I would argue exactly that. Because I'm looking at who is really intensively involved in Facebook. And I'm finding that actually um, it's the elderly who... Or, or, there's, a, there's a case called Dr. Karamath in the book who's actually not just getting older, but he's housebound because he's got a disability. He is using Facebook from when he brushes his teeth in the morning to when he brushes his teeth at night, okay? For him, it's hugely important. For shy Arvind, it's important. Um, for a mother who's in the last story, who's just gone home because she's just had a baby and she can't get out the way she used to, it's important. So I would argue that in the future, Facebook is going to migrate, not necessarily the elderly as they are now, because they're still a bit technophobic, but when the 50-year-olds of today become the elderly, the only thing they're going to ask about their old age homes is what's the broadband connection like. Because the people who really are going to get into this thing are the people for whom it matters, who want the intensity of sociality, but don't necessarily get it. Now, um, time's getting on. So I'm not going to talk about the home, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the, a couple of other th points I want to make very briefly. One is that we normally think of uh, Facebook as a thing that connects friends together, right? A network like that. But one of the things that I realized is that we're missing something if we don't realize that there's another relationship here, which we need to investigate almost in its own right, which is the relationship to Facebook. That actually, that's also a relationship. And I started to think about this. It's, it's like, how do you think about it? Is it like a, I thought maybe it's like a sort of best friend relationship, right? So I thought about that, and I start, so I did a lot of you know, careful academic analysis of, of what a best friend relationship is. Actually, I didn't do any of that. I watched a lot of Sex in the City, right? And then I felt I had a good idea of what a best friend is, you know? Somebody who basically, even when nobody else wants to talk to you, and you can't believe he said that, and whatever, etc., you can talk to about it. But at 3 o'clock in the morning, even your bestest best friend may not actually relish being woken up, so or you can download all this stuff on your head, as it were, and, 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 and feel that instead of being kind of lonely and everyone's against you, you're actually out there in some kind of social setting. Um, but at 3 a.m., you can go on Facebook. And you don't know that all those postings and all those photographs were there for you, but you don't know they weren't. And that is often sufficient to feel that this is something that acts as a relationship for you when it might matter. To go to the, the last level, I mentioned God, okay? Must have sounded a bit weird, so let me just say a little bit about that. The point was that I'm trying to understand all that is going on in all this massive amount of communication and posting, etc., that's going on around Facebook. And there seems to be more than I can really understand. We can see that it has a lot of levels. There's the levels of, you know, your close friends, who any way you were interacting with, when you were at school or wherever else you were, you keep interacting with them on Facebook. We all know the next level up is the stalking relationship, right? In other words, the person who doesn't actually know that we're necessarily engaged with them all the time, but we are, for whatever reason, <laughs> all right? And then it's going on. Then I said there's this kind of meta relationship there. But then what about all the others? What about the, there's a couple of hundred surplus out there. Now, with the kids, 
It's because I want to make sure I've got more friends than you who's sitting next to me, right? We know that. But for a 40-year-old, no, I don't think so. I think there's something else going on. And one of the things that occurred to me when I was working in Trinidad is you could see a transformation. You know, Facebook used to be kind of happy land. Happy Christmas. Happy birthday. Facebook reminded me, you know. Uh, happy wedding. Happy whatever. That was Facebook. But I'm watching things change, at least in Trinidad, and I think Trinidad is often in the vanguard of what's going on. In the last year or so, you can see that it's changing because people are starting to put on much more difficult things. They're starting to talk about illness. Um, people are dying on Facebook. And one of the things, I don't have time now, but it can come up in the questions, is I think there's a really important relationship between death and Facebook that's developing at the moment. Um, there's all sorts of other stuff going on. And people are putting, and at first, you know, people would put up, I mean, Trinidadians would put up the sexiest picture they have themselves ever will go on Facebook, okay? But it's not the only picture that goes up. The typical other picture will be eating a piece of pizza, right? Somebody tickled you, and that photo also goes up when you look your absolute worst, right? Um, there's a whole greater range of stuff going on there, and people are exposing much more about themselves on Facebook. And um, the argument I would make, if I had more time, but it's there in the book and elsewhere, is that I think that what people are using this for is a site also which, at least in terms of the religiosity of contemporary Trinidad, would be called a site of witnessing, that people see them. And Trinidadians, um, there's another chapter in the book which is about why Trinidadians would say that what you see on Facebook is more truthful about a person than what you see when you meet them. We tend to think the opposite. Again, I can debate that. But they do think that, often. And, one of the, and the point, then, is that... It, Religion itself, amongst the other things that religion can be said to be, is a kind of site of moral encompassment. Because you know that who you are and what you are is seen, you also understand that it is judged, and that actually affects how you understand yourself to be. And in some sort of way, I'm thinking that maybe Facebook also may add to this propensity, if you like, to create sites of moral encompassment, and that's kind of the highest level. So to conclude... One of the main things I'm trying to say here is that do not just fit things that develop um, today into this long-term historical narrative, as though they all, everything gears us towards whatever it is, greater individualism, less community, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, do not assume, for example, that it continues even the trajectory of the Internet. You are going to understand Facebook better if you think of it, although it uses the Internet, as the exact opposite of the Internet. The internet developed all those diverse relation networks. Facebook puts them all together, right? The internet developed through the capacity often of anonymity. Facebook has a much more difficult relationship to anonymity. And in a whole series of different registers, I actually find that the interesting about Facebook is the degree to which the opposite of what we thought the internet was, and also that it actually opposes many of these greater transformations. The internet, in, to go back to the thing I said at the very beginning, I would argue, is actually a social networking site that makes people more like social networking sites. And in that respect, makes them actually more like that which anthropologists have traditionally studied, rather than the other social sciences. Um, I don't know if that's a bad thing, from the point of view of the relevance of anthropology, but it's certainly very different from the way it's talked about in kind of journalism, um, the media, etc. There's other things, I think, going on there. And you're only going to discover them if you actually have the patience to go out and, ha and do these intensive investigations to look at it not as a company, not as a technology, but in terms of what's going on with the people that use it. And the good news there is, having done this study... I just heard a month ago that I've got a grant from the European Research Council for the next five years to do a project with a whole lot of other people on the impact of social networking in seven different countries um, to see it comparatively. So hopefully anything I've said today, um, I'm going to be able to say a hell of a lot better five years from now. Thank you. Excellent. We have about 10 minutes for questions. 
Uh, I do ask, uh, many of you are veterans and will know this rule, but g given how full the room is, I'm going to assume we have some newcomers. The, the rule here is that if you are called on to ask a question, you have to wait until you have a microphone. We have two people who bring microphones down from either aisle uh, so that you can be heard on the live webcast or the podcast or any of the casts. Uh, so who has questions? We have one over there. You'll go first, sir. And then we have one there. Hello? Oh, okay. Um, uh, yeah, my question is, um, you were talking about uh, polymedia and how other media interacts with the experience of Facebook. Um, is it possible that, um, that the pictures that are on Facebook aren't necessarily representative of that person's life because it depends on when a camera is brought to an occasion? Mm. Um, yeah, I think the point I'd make is I, I'm probably, as an anthropologist, pretty sceptical of the idea of things being representational of a person anyway. That is to say, um, it was always the case that whatever circumstances we were in were partial. If I met you at work, um, it's probably a different sort of person I'm meeting than if I meet you in a party. So, yes, absolutely. Um, the photographs that actually go on Facebook, if they tend to be, say, more party ones or they tend to be more um, work ones, will be different and will give a different impression of an aspect of a person. But the point I would make is that there's nothing particular about Facebook at all in that. That was always true, and it was true on every aspect of the way a person presents themselves out in the world or indeed presents themselves, even I would say, to themselves. Um, we, are, we have that multiplicity. Um, it will change as well. The genre, I mean, any form of, of a kind of putting ourselves out there is a sense of genre of the way we do it. Like, you know, the pizza photo, the sexy photo, etc. And these genres themselves um, develop over time, and they may well develop according to um, proximity. So um, Trinidadians today, for, I mean, used to see Facebook as a computer-based phenomenon, right? Um, one of the big changes, and this relates to polymedia, is um, they can't bear now to be without a BlackBerry. Because... Otherwise, you've got to go to find a computer, turn it on, it's in a location, and, you, you, you know, your life is going on in Facebook. You don't want to be absent from it. Um, you want it there in your pocket when you can get to it at any, kind, any time. And that will have an impact, surely, on because the, then the photograph may be taken with the BlackBerry and they may go on Facebook. It will certainly change what goes on. Um. Do you think that one of the appeals of Facebook is its actual generality and lack of rules? And what I mean by that is if you look at something like LinkedIn, it's a very specific professional networking site, whereas, as you've said yourself, Facebook can be about playing games or having an acquaintance status or a friend or so on. And just touching on that, and the last point that was made, what do you think the role of what I would call the avatar is in Facebook. I have friends in Facebook that I know as a particular person, mm. but for various reasons, they don't go under their own name. They have an assumed name. They might not want to be bothered. But do you think also there's an element of being able to break away from certain conventions and to experiment? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's always a kind of tension between what you might call the structuring effects of the particular technology that you're using and the creativity of the user. Now, although the comparison you've made is between LinkedIn and Facebook, and Facebook seems to lend itself um, to more sort of possibilities than LinkedIn, actually, Facebook did as much to replace MySpace. And MySpace actually probably had quite a lot more freedom, certainly in terms of the way you could transform the site itself, compared to Facebook. So Facebook, in the kind of parameter of structuring, um, is somewhere kind of in the middle. Um, easier than LinkedIn, less easier than, than MySpace. And I think that's typical. Uh, people actually often find it easier to play with something which is sufficiently homogenized by the structure that they recognize very easily what is going on, but nevertheless they can play with it. Which leads to the second part of your question. To what degree can we play with this? Because on the face of it, Facebook seems something that would be really um, the antithesis to anonymity. It seems so exposing, so kind of um, there in yourself compared to, say, previous uses of the internet, where anonymity was extremely important. And yet, 
as you pointed out, there are people who will ignore that aspect of Facebook and say, what the hell, I'm going to go on as an avatar. I'm going to... And that seems to change from place to place. I had a very good student in the Digital Anthropology program last year looking at Facebook in Colombia. And she found there were very big genres of, how to put it, lying. I mean, just being complete, doing all sorts of completely dishonest registers of Facebook use, which have become very important in Colombian usage, certainly amongst the kids. Um, and which I'd never heard of in the UK. I mean, th there are other forms of anonymizing that go on in the UK, but I'd never seen anything like this Colombian case. Um, so uh, the other side to it is, whatever we think about the structuring propensities of a given technology, um, we have no idea what the hell somebody might actually end up doing with it. And it's often the very opposite of what we think the technology would have lent itself to, but we only encounter that through these genres of usage. Um, and those will differ from place to place. More questions? And somebody over here? Oh, down here, down low. Woman in the black sweater. Hello? OK. Um, hi, yeah, I just wanted to ask, because Facebook's being used more and more by advertisers, how do you think that will change how people will use it? And what should advertisers be thinking when they want to put themselves here? Um, okay, my brief is, is, in a sense, social usage. So I'm actually looking at the, the sort of, as it were, end user. It's not at all surprising, of course, that, A, advertisers uh, want to do things with it, but even more, that Facebook has got to have a business plan, as everybody knows. You know, it's providing this thing. Where does it actually get its money from? So there's a, there's a huge interest in creating um, a link with commerce of one kind or another. Um, now, I think that... Actually, um, the, it goes back with the other question. So, if you like, the advertising is trying to lead people in a certain direction. Um, but if you actually look at the usage, at least of the people I'm studying, um, they will use that aspect, which suits them in general. So, for example, um, I found that Trinidadians themselves, irrespective of anything that the commerce wanted to do, actually quite like the idea that these things are coming into Facebook. Because they say, what the local expression is, it's a one-stop shop. They don't want to be bothered to go outside of Facebook to surf the internet. They just can't be bothered. They just think, why can't we have everything on Facebook? Then we can do everything, and it's just easier for us, which, of course, would delight Facebook, right? But this is not coming from the company Facebook. It's coming from what Trindanians say to me. Um, equally, in the Philippines, I found people who like the idea that they can use different aspects of the internet to go shopping with her mother, who's in California, um, surf commercial site together, and then the mother pays for it and has it shipped back to the Philippines. So there's certainly commercial usage that comes from the ground, from the demands of the populations using it, which will vary. Um, advertising that is simply trying to follow its own agenda, if it does not equate with that, I suspect will be largely ignored and will largely fail. Um, so the answer to your question is, um, the, if you're interested in the commercial side, it's not what you want. It's, as often the case, um, it's what happens to fit within the particular interests of users. But commerce, I mean, you know, when we talk about commerce, um, buying stuff is part and parcel of um, people's kind of daily rhythm and things. And if it fits in as convenient um, with things or getting to know about things fits in as convenient with them, um, face, people will use it on Facebook. Um, they won't necessarily see that, as some people would, as a detrimental commercialization. But other populations will. There are populations, possibly more here, who will look at this and see Facebook as a social phenomena that is solid to the degree to which it is commercialized and will be looking for alternative sites because they feel the authenticity of their relationship isn't compatible with that commerce. Trinidadians would not think that. 